Okay, well, uh, good evening. We're here to discuss the impending holiday coming up, Bezal Hashem, Haba Aleinu Letova, which is um, Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah is considered to be the Day of Judgment. You know what the Chazal say, right, in the Hazor Kadosh about Rosh Hashanah. It says that Rosh Hashanah is in the month of Tishrei, right? The first, the first day of Tishrei is Rosh Hashanah. So regarding Tishrei, there's a comparison always between Tishrei, the month of Rosh Hashanah, and the month of Nisan, which is the month of the spring holidays, Pesach, right? Uh, that, that, that series of holidays over there. So, the question is, how does one compare to the other, right? Comparison test. So what they say the Chazal is that Tishrei has a different quality than Nisan, even though they're both similar. There's a big holiday there, there's a major thing going on, it's a, it's, a, it's a time of salvation, you know, holiness, a lot of holiness in the air at the, in those times. Nisan and Tishrei. So what is, how does one stack up against the other? So it says, right, that uh, the Saint Zohar Kadosh, that Yom Tishrei is more harsh than Nisan. What does that mean? Nisan, in the spring, is a time of chesed, it's a time of kindness. So a person can, has, more, has more leeway to get away with things that he will not get away with on Tishrei. Tishrei is a time of din time of judgment, you know? So even though we have the holiday of Sukkot, which is a very happy time, very joyous time of Sukkot, like nothing really, they say the Chazal, there's no happy time like the time of Sukkot. At the times of Bet HaMikdash, they had the, they had the Bet HaShu'eva, right? The Simchat Bet HaShu'eva over there. What does that mean? They used to get together at the time of Sukkot, and they would uh, make a big party over there, a big bash, in the Bet HaMikdash. That's where it was. Right? What was, what, was, what did it involve? Music and dancing. That's what it was, right? They had played over their music. They had some people who knew how to play very, very well. And also there was a lot of dancing going on there, you know, going in circles and all kinds of stuff. It was a big, big party. You know, they say if you, ever, if you never went to that party, you never saw a happy occasion in your life. It was considered to be something very, very, very special. Very happy occasion, right? Uh, and also, right, I wanted to stress what we talked about inside as well. What does that mean? That the Chazal say that even though this was a a very beautiful occasion of the Bet HaMikdash, the Simchat Bet HaShu'eva. They, how many times did they do it on Sukkot? They used to do it every night on Sukkot. Can you imagine? On Chol Moed, every night they had a party. Living it up. Because you're supposed to be like, Ach Sameach, that's what it says in the Pasuk, right? Only Sameach on that, on Sukkot. Living it up. 100% Sameach. There shouldn't be no sad moment for you on Sukkot. That's what it says, right? In, in the Pasuk. Ve'aita Ach Sameach. Only Sameach. So Sukkot is a, is a very, very, ho- very holy and very uh, happy occasion. Nothing like it when it comes to the happiness of Sukkot. Most joyous time. They say that nevertheless though, even though it's a very happy occasion, but the women and men were separate in, in this occasion, right? As, like, as we said, in every Jewish, when there's a public occasion, a public gathering, a ceremony, whatever it is, some kind of, a, uh, all kinds of religious issues or just, you know, social events, all kinds of things, the women, women and men have to be separate always, men and women. That's the idea. So there also, they had the women in the Ezra Nashim, there was a place over there, right up, like a little balcony they had over there. Right? Uh, they had the women up, up, up there. there was, so the women were up, up there looking down, like we have in the Bet the, Knesset, the right? In the shul over here. The same idea. So that's the way it was. The women were upstairs, and the men were downstairs, uh, the, the, separate from them. So there also we had a separation as well, right? So that's one of the things that the Chazal learned from, by the way, that every event, public event, Jewish event, requires to be separate, men and women separate. That's the idea. So here also the same thing was, was applied. There's also another thing which is very interesting about that party. You know what they say, right? That who was the who was the ones who were doing the music and the dancing mainly? Who was the one who was leading the you know procession? You understand? So was it uh, you know? Uh, we're not we're not talking about uh, you know the Piamentas, you know or the uh, Leonard Skinner or you know uh, Deep Purple you know we're not talking about these guys right we don't bring over there Goim to play you know uh, uh, over there even though there are some Goim who know to play very well right uh, the music as as you know but in the Bet Hamikdash who was doing the music and the dancing it wasn't any Goy or also it wasn't any regular Jew so who was it it was the leaders of the community what does that mean the rabbis you know and the Chachamim and uh, the ones who were the ones who were the top brass, you know, of, of the community, they were the ones who were doing the music and dancing, right? So you know, the question is why? What's the reason why they should do it? They should be they should be serious, no? Like you know, austere. They should be standing there, you know, three piece suit, you know, tie, you know, like this thing there, you know, like this, you know? like you know, the whole bureau, 
a poll bureau, you know, kind of thing. They have deal, right? But no, see, the, the Rambam says that when it comes to a simcha of, of Hashem, when it comes to a simcha, which is for the sake of Hashem, even the leaders, you know, uh, the, the, the rabbis have to be like that. They have to get into it, you know, they have to sing and dance. They should be the first ones at the forefront of that. Not to sit there, you know, like a, like a log, you know, like a, like a cedar tree, you know, like this, you know, like this. No, it's not the way it should be. Don't be stiff. When it comes to the simcha, you have to let go, you know, and uh, open up and, uh, you know, jump around and dance yeah, and sing. Yeah, time. you have to be at the forefront of that. That's, that's the idea, right? And if a, it says the Rambam that if a person doesn't do that and he's stiff, you know, he can't loosen up when it comes to these parties for the sake of Hashem, he's considered to be a, like a sinner, you know, rasha, you know, like a person who can't uh, serve Hashem properly. When, when there's a time for simcha, you have to be sameach. You know, there's a time for everything. You know, same, same thing when it comes to Simcha Torah. We're going to do Simcha Torah. After all the holidays go out, Simcha Torah is the last day, right? So there also, a person shouldn't be stiff. You know, just stand there like a log, you know, and watch everybody else. You know, like you know, some kind of, you know, <laughs> they're passing through like a parade, you know, Paradis, yeah. you know, like, you're sitting there, you know, and everybody else is dancing. I'll just sit there and watch, you know. Uh, that's not what it's supposed to be. Go and dance also. Persist, participate. Mm-hmm. You know, don't be stiff, you know. Don't be like a log or like a you know, tree, you know, standing there like that. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So when it comes, right, exactly, a lump like that. That's the idea. So a person has to know, right, when it comes to a time for Simcha, or for Simcha Torah, we're doing for Kavod of the Torah. So what? For Kavod of the Torah, you, don't, you can't loosen up. You can't get, get joyous. That means that there's a problem with the way you're serving Hashem, right? Yeah. You can't you can't really get into it emotionally, you know. You can't serve Hashem emotionally, so a person has to go out, you know, and give give it give it all he's got. And they say, by the way, that if a person does that, if he does simcha Torah like that, and he sweats, you know. <coughs> well, let's let's put it this way, right? When, if you do if you do simcha Torah properly, once you're done, you should need a shower, you know. That's it should be like that, right? You should need a shower because you should be like all wet. That's, that's how. If you're not. You didn't do the mitzvah properly, right? That's the idea. That's, uh, that's, that, that's, that's the way it should be. So the idea is like always that we should, we should be, we should be sameach. But nevertheless, right, all these things that we mentioned, Sukkot is considered to be the most happy time of the year. But nevertheless, they say that Tishrei, the month of Tishrei as, as, as a whole, it's a time of judgment, it's a time of din. You know? So what does that mean? That a person has to be very, very careful how he behaves on Tishrei. He won't get away with so much on Tishrei like he gets away with Nisan over there in Pesach time. Over there he can get away with more. That's why they say, by the way, when it comes to the Geula, the redemption of the Jewish people, they say, when is it going to be? Is it going to be in Tishrei or is it going to be in Nisan? Right? Nisan, right? You know, the Chazal say, right? Benisan Nigalu, Benisan Atidim Gigael. What does that mean? They were redeemed the first time in Nisan when they came out of Mitzrayim. Also in the future, when Mashiach comes, the redemption will be in, in Nisan as well. So the Zorah Kadosh asks, right, regarding this, why is it going to be Nisan, not Tishrei? Tishrei is also a very holy time. So why Nisan? The Gibbala is going to be Nisan. What's going to be Tishrei, by the way? There's also going to be something in Tishrei as well, d- during that time. You know what they say, right? The War of Gog and Magog is going to be in Tishrei. The first Mashiach. You understand? The War of Gog and Magog is going to be in Tishrei. When? On Sukkot. That's where the Gogogo is going to be. That's the idea, right? And that's exactly why when we read the, when we read the Haftarah in, in Sukkot, what do we read about? Gogo Magog. That's what we're reading about over there. All the time, we read all the passages from Gogo Magog. Why is that? Because that's the time that Gogo Magog is going to be. All the Haftarah that we read over there is talking about that. Most, many of them. So that, that, this is the reason why. So again, right, the war is a time of din also, right? Time, time of judgment because people are going to die over there, right? It's going to be, you know, something very harsh. Gogo Magog is not an easy thing, right? So that's going to be in Tishrei. But the Geula, the redemption is going to be, Daskana, Daskana, you know, it's going to be in, in, in Nisan. So it says, Zarkadosh, what's the reason why? It says that if, since the time of Tishrei is a time of Din, if they would make the Geula in the time of Tishrei, a lot of people would not be Zoche to, to be involved with that. To, to be, they, they would not be able to pass through. You know, we're Gavido then, you know? They can't, you can't, they wouldn't make it. You know, get a failing grade, you know, flunk out. They would flunk out. They will get left behind. You understand? So, what does that mean? The Akadosh Baruch Hu did us a favor not to make the Geula in Tishrei. Because that would be bad. Why? Because all the people who are not so observant, who are not so religious, they wouldn't be able to get through on, on Tishrei. But on Nisan, since it's a time of Chesed, so then we'll get the maximum people through. You know? We'll get the maximum results from... from uh, right? The Akadosh Baruch Hu had mercy on us to make the Geula in, in, in Nisan in order to get... 
the, everybody that we can push out to push through, we push them through. You know, get into, get them into the geula. You know, there's also uh, a mama, right, which is very strange. And and, and Gemara Yushami, Talmud Yushami, it says over there regarding this what we just mentioned that all the people who are going to be alive at that time during the geula when the geula occurs, they have no portion in the world to come. That's what it says, right? And them chelik That's what it says in Gemara. Very strange, right? How can there be such a thing like that? What, all those people not going to have chelik and right? What's why? For why? For why? What's the reason why? There's not going to be any righteous people there. The truth is, you know, the Zohar Kadosh says that during the time of the geula, there won't be many tzaddikim. Like you know, there won't be many. Most of them are going to be wicked. That's what it says in the Zohar Kadosh. You know, going to be, going to be. Most of them are going to be sinners. It's not going to be such a great time, you know, uh, at that time. That's what it says. Very interesting, whatever. But the point is, right? It says Yerushalmi that they all don't have a portion in the world to come. So what's the reason why? It says Yerushalmi, you know why? Because it's enough for them what they're going to see in the time of Mashiach. In other words, the happiness they're going to have, the simcha, which, which they're going to have at the, during the time, time of Mashiach, that's enough for them. Diane, Diane. You can't eat on two tables, right? The Gemara says, you know? Not everybody is to have two tables, right? One table over here, one table downstairs. Either you got this table or that table, right? You can't be at both tables at the same time. That's so, the idea. So, right? so what, what happens is like this, right? According to this Gemara, they're going to have the Yemut Mashiach. They're going to be Zohar for that. But Olam Baba, no. So, you know, if you really think about that, right? It's like amazing. I mean, wow, this is like, you know, it seems like very harsh. This kind of thing. You know, what, what kind of thing is this, right? But isn't Mashiach Olam Baba? That's, as we said, right? Different stages, right? There's Mashiach, there's Olam Baba, there's different stages. Right? Because the Olam Abba is after 6,000. Mm-hmm. Mashiach is before 6,000. That's, that's the difference, right? In terms of the timeline, that's the way it works. They say that, uh, so why, why would these people not have a portion in the world to come? So the truth is, right, it seems like it's talking over there about a certain group of people. What does that mean? There's going to be a group of people over there, like the Chazal described, the sages, they describe, there's going to be a group of people who are going to be very stubborn at that time. When Mashiach comes? Yeah. When, what does that mean? When Mashiach ben Yosef will come, Right? His job is to bring the people to, to, to Shuvah. That's one of his jobs. You know, and that's, that's a difficult job. You know, when you're dealing with Jews, you know what I mean? Everybody has their own opinions, yeah, everybody has their own... Different. You know what I mean? Right, exactly. So to get them to agree to, to one thing, right? It's very, as you can see what they're doing with the government, right? They can't even form a government over there. They're probably going to third elections, you know? They're, they're third, third time. Third, round three, you know? They're, they're probably gonna, there's going to be a knockout sometime, you know? Some ways they knock out somebody out, right? That's the round three, round four, round four. That's what's going on. It's unbelievable. What do you think this scene, when he comes, this scene, is he going to come on a special... Um, bicycle? Bicycle. Harley Davidson, uh, Harley Davidson, So you know, I, regarding this, you know, how he's going to come, it's an interesting question. But I just want to make this point, right? One question, uh, one yeah. thing that it says, right? The Mashiach Ben Yosef is going to come, and it's going to be, uh, for, it's going to be an uphill battle for him. You know what I mean? He's going to have to fight with the people because they're going to be against him. You know, just like they're against today. You know, the, the rabbis, they don't want to listen to the rabbis. Oh, he's also a rabbi. You know, what do you think he is? He's, he's also a rabbi, Mashiach. So they're going to say, listen, you know, you're, you're a fanatic rabbi. You know, we don't want to listen to you. Get, get out of our face, you know. The Mashiach ben Yosef, from Yosef at Tzaddik. Right? So, you understand? Soon as so, the miracle yeah. will happen when he comes, while he's coming, once he arrives, the miracle will happen. That's the idea, right? He has that to get established the, first and then... He has to get established, that's the idea, right? It's an uphill battle. There's no miracles for him, you understand? He has to fight a battle like according to the laws of nature, you know what I mean? We will have any... He has to fight. Notice to prepare ourselves for the event? I'm sorry? Advanced notice we will have. <laughs> there's going to be all kinds of signs. Yeah, there's going to be all kinds of signs. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, they say, right, what's, what's really the signs? What's really the signs of Mashiach? They say, once you see, right, the nations are stirring up in war against each other, that's the sign of Mashiach. World War Three, you know, you know, if you see this kind of thing, you know, they're, they're fighting with each other, you know. We already see it today, by the way, you know, there are signs like this, you know, like all these things are going on. It, it's like, very, very close, you know, very, according to the signs that we see, Red very, very, very close, Red. very, very close, because one of the Midrashim, you know what it says, right, regarding that, it says that the, the king of Persia, 
we'll, we'll, attack the, we'll attack Arabia. That's what it says. This is exactly what's going on. Exactly what it says. Where does it say? It's the Yakut We were just talking about that yesterday at the UN. The guy from Iran. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They hate it. Yeah, yeah, Which one? Who was with The guy from Ahel. The guy who told him. Right. The, the Mullah, Mullah, Mullah. Rohani, Rohani. Machshim right? Avazicha. That's what he's talking about. Right? It's over there. So we see this sign of the uh, this conflict between Persia and Arabia. This is one of the signs of Mashiach. They're going to have a day. They're going to. It says right. They're going to conquer. They're going to. The Persians are going to go and conquer Arabia. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna conquer that area. Wow. It's gonna be uh, wars because of this, all kinds of things. This is how it's here. gonna start. This whole, this it's gonna thing. be war here in the streets. So, getting back to what we said, right? That uh, regarding this issue of Mashiach, Mashiach ben Yosef is gonna have an uphill battle. You know, it's gonna be very hard for him. They're gonna be against him. We have today Arab Rav, you know, people who are very secular, you know, against religion. Which, which religious you know. going to be against them? Religious, uh, Jew, Jewish people going to be against them? We're talking about, yeah, we're talking about people who are against religion, you know? They don't want to have religion. Against religion. Yeah, they, they want religion. Yes. Like we have today, you know, we have uh, this guy, Atheist. Lieberman, you know, the Lieberman, and we have Lapid, you know, these people, like, like this. So they're going to be against him. They're going to be fighting against him. So he's going to have to fight an uphill battle to, to, to overcome them. It's going to be very, very difficult, you know, that's the idea. question. Yeah. These people that are having a fight with, uh, in, in this battle, they have nothing to gain by Mashiach coming. Why would they want to fight? Because they don't want, they don't want, they don't want, they don't want to stop doing, living their lives, you know, eating chazir, eating, you know, bacon, you know, and ha ham and cheese sandwiches. They want to keep doing that, you know, eating chocolate covered ants. You know, they don't want to stop these things. They want to keep going with this uh, lifestyle. They don't want somebody to come and tell them, you know, religious coercion, you know, try to coerce us. Don't, don't, don't tell us what to do, you know, we're free we do whatever we want, that's the idea, you know it's a battle between the, the, the zealots and the secular, you know, that's the idea this is the this is, the, this is, this is what we're talking about this they'll, is the, they'll this change their mind when they see God, that's when they'll change their mind so getting back, to, getting back to what we said, right getting back to, we, we, went, we, we, we went far off, right, the idea, but the idea is like this, right that <laughs> so as we said <laughs> so what's going to be is that these people who are very stubborn, by the way, what's going to be is that Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to take them out to the desert, as we mentioned, right? And, and fight with them over there, you know, to, to like argue with them, you know? What's with you people? Why don't you want to do tshuva? He's going to force himself? them. Yeah. He's going to take them out. Like it, like it happened in, in the Moshe Abeno. He took them out of Egypt. He's going to be like an episode like that. He's going to take them to the desert, I these people who are stubborn, yeah. and he's going to tell them over there, no, no, you know? What's the, what, yeah, that how long are you going to stay like this? 40 years he's going to force them to do tshuva. So what does that mean? That these people who are forced to do tshuva, they don't, it's not if you really look at it, think about it, right? they don't really deserve to have a portion of the world to come. You know why? Because they were forced to do tshuva. They didn't do it on their own volition. Zechut yarak. You know, they don't have zechut of doing tshuva for themselves. So therefore, they're going to only merit y y Mashiach. But they're not going to merit Olam They only get Mashiach. That time they're going to get. It's going to be also very good. What they're gonna, but it's, that's only temporary. You know what I mean? It's only a few years. And then coming to Alam they're not going to get there. You know why? Because they, they did tshuva with coercion. They were like, they twist their neck, you know? The headlock, you know, like, you know, twist their arm. You know, that's the, that's the idea. That's not really considered to be a real tshuva. Real tshuva is when you do on your own volition. You know what I mean? That's the idea. So whatever, anyway, getting back to what we said, right? That Tishrei is a time of din. That's, what, that's the bottom line. Yeah, it's a time of strict judgment. You know? Yeah, very strict judgment. So what does that mean? When a person goes into Rosh Hashanah, he really should, you know, do tshuva and elul. Don't wait till the last minute. You know what I mean? Last, last minute is no good. That's why we have slichot. We have all these preparations. You know, the shofar to remind you every day. Listen, hey, wake up! It's time for tshuva. You know, don't wait till the last minute. Don't wait till it's too late. Do tshuva now and elul. And then when you go into Rosh Hashanah, the din will be already much more favorable. You know, but if you come in not ready, and you're like coming in, you know. You're totally haphazard. You don't know what's what's hitting you. So then, you know, the, the situation is much more much more vulnerable. So a person has to come into Rosh Hashanah already with some preparation. They say, by the way, that if a person does that, if a person comes into Rosh Hashanah prepared, what does that mean? He did. He went to Slichot and he had the Juchuva. He did the Vidui. You know, and he he regretted his sins. They say already one third of his sins they they take off from him. Even before Rosh Hashanah. One third he's already forgiven. Just because he did the preparation of coming into Rosh Hashanah with the proper, the proper right the state of mind. The state of, the state of his, his neshama. That's the idea. So therefore a person should try to do tshuva before Rosh Hashanah. But we also have, right, if a person wasn't able to do so much, or whatever, even if he was able to do, 
who's going to do everything, right? Not everybody can do everything. So the point is, right, they say because of this, the most important mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah is the shofar. That's the most important mitzvah of the, show, of the Rosh Hashanah. So what does that mean? Right, exactly. A person shouldn't skip that. He shouldn't miss the shofar. Uzar Mazrat, you know? Whatever happens, make sure you're there when they're doing the shofar. Of course. Right? You, uh, you saw, Don't sleep you that day, right? Go, go to sleep and go do something, you know, go off and, you know, you hang sell, around the park, you know, you somewhere. Sell you sell you sell shofar? No, I don't. Know. No, <laughs> you don't do <laughs> right, so the, the most important you thing is to... You kill them. You yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not sorry, I, I thought he was talking about selling the shofar. But anyway, right, the point is that uh, the shofar is number one mitzvah in the Shor Hashanah. Because also it's, it's from the Torah. In the Torah it says, right, Yom Teruah. It's a day of Teruah. It's a day of blowing the shofar. Yeah, so the shofar. blowing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah is considered from, from the Torah, but the prayers on Rosh Hashanah is considered to be only rabbinical. So therefore, right, the shofar is considered to be much, much more important. There's also another element there, which is what? A person has to understand why we blow the shofar. What's the reason why? The main reason is because that a person, what happens is that so Satan comes in on that day with all kinds of accusations in the heavenly court against people, right? All the sins that they did all year, right? everything, they comes with a nice briefcase, right? Yeah. Laptop, you know, whatever, you know? He's got a hard drive. Yeah. Everything is on a memory there, on video, everything, you know? Comes in, prepared. Nice briefcase he brings in. Okay, let's, the court is, you know, the court is open, right? The session, right, exactly, right? They open up the court. So now he has everything, you know, he's armed and, you know, armed and ready to go. Every accusation, you know, to say about the Jewish people. Every person, accuse him of everything. So what happens is, right, they say that the only thing that can stop that is the shofar. What does that mean? Once a satan hears a shofar, right, what happens is, like, he's the accusing angel, he's the accusing lawyer, right, the, the prosecutor, he's the prosecution lawyer. So what happens is, you know what happens, the prosecutor had a heart attack, you know, cardiac arrest. Impactidarta, you know? He fell on the floor, that's it, he's down, right? They say, what happened? The prosecutor, he died, you know? He fainted. So we, the court is adjourned, right? That's it, right? That's, that's, that's the idea. So what, what causes the court to be adjourned? The shofar. When the Satan hears the shofar, it mixes him up, right? It confuses him, he can't accuse anymore. You know, it's like when a person hears some kind of a noise, like something, you know, and he can't con- concentrate anymore. Yeah, right, so why... Why does the shofar confuse the satan so much? That's the, that's the, that's the reason, right? That's the, that's the question. Why does, it, why, does it, why does it confuse him? What, he's, he's an angel. Why, why, why should he be confused by something like that? He's not even on the earth over here. He can't, how, how does he hear the shofar over there, right? How, what, what's, what's the story? So they say, right, the reason why satan is, always, uh, is so confused by the shofar, you know why? Because they know, it says, right, it says in the Nabi, that on that day of the redemption that we talked about, right, Mashiach and this, what's going to be is the satan is going to be killed himself. There's a Gemara which talks about this in Masechet Sukkah regarding there's going to be a big funeral, right? The day of the, the Mashiach comes, there's going to be a big funeral over there. So there's two opinions over there what the funeral is about. It's going to be a huge funeral with millions of people there. One says it's talking about Mashiach ben Yosef that he's going to die. Right? That's the funeral. But the other one says no, it's talking about the death of Satan. Satan is going to be killed. So what does that mean? Akadosh Baruch Hu is going to slaughter Satan when Mashiach comes. So Satan knows that, right? So he, he at all costs is trying to prevent that from happening. Because he knows once the once, once Mashiach comes, his role is over, right? He's going to be you know, out to, you know, the, like they say, you know, they used to say in, in Russia, you know, when they used to get rid of the leader, they would say they send him to vacation, you know, Dacha, Dacha is the Gagzonas, you know, the Dacha. So they're going to send Satan to Dacha. You know what I mean? When, 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 when Mashiach comes. Why is that? Because Yetzirah is not going to be there anymore. Once the Yetzirah is not there, also Satan is not there. The Satan, the whole point of Satan is to be the Yetzirah. You know? Once the Yetzirah doesn't exist, Satan also doesn't exist. So what's going to be is that when he hears the shofar of Satan, you know what he thinks, right? He says, oh man, it must be the time of the Geula. Why, why, why? That's it, I'm done. My goose is cooked, right? That's it. I'm done. Yeah. So he gets nervous, you know, cardiac arrest, he faints over there. What the You know, pause it. Ah! That's it, finished. The only thing that does that is, is the shofar. This is something amazing, right? Mm. How is it that he gets fooled every time, the satan? What, he's so stupid like that? Doesn't know that, uh, right? Uh, what's the reason? He's such a fool like that? He doesn't know that we, every Rosh Hashanah, we do, we do shofar? Yeah. Right? So the truth is, right, the satan is not a human being. He's an angel, you know, malach. So angel is like programmed, you know? He has a certain program. Mm. That program, in his mind, of satan, once he hears a shofar, he associates that with his death. 
with the mice. You understand? And this is the reason why the shofar is the only remedy for that. So therefore, a person has to be very, very careful to heal the shofar. This is the idea, right? So in order to understand, we talked about it inside, but we have to elaborate a little bit more. Also, that everybody should hear about this. The shofar that we're talking about, there's many kolot. There's many voices of the shofar that we do. Main tuot during Rosh Hashanah. So which is the most important one according to the Torah? We're talking about the one that they do after Shachrit. First they read the Torah, right? That's the idea. First they bring the Torah, they read the Torah. They do the Haftarah. Once they finish the Haftarah, so then they do the Shofar. Right? During, that, during that blowing of the Shofar, everybody sits down. The only one who's standing is the one who's Tokeh, the one who's blowing the Shofar. He stands, that's the custom, right? And the ones who are listening are all sitting down. So what happens is that he will say a bracha, right? Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Hashem Kedeshenu B'Mitzvot Tzav Etzimanu, Lishmua Kol Shofar. And he's going to say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Right? Sheikh Yanu Kiyimanu, Vigyanu Lazim and Hazay. It's going to make Sheikh Yanu also, right? Since we do it, it's a time bound mitzvah, which we do once a year, so therefore we make Sheikh Yanu as well for the shofar. But that's only the, that's only the, right, the, 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 the first, the first one, right? Not, not the, so anyway, but the point is like this, right? That um, when we make the, when we make the shofar, the Sheikh Yanu, then he starts to blow the shofar. Right? How many voices that he, does he do at that time? Altogether, it's 30 voices. Shloshim kolot. Lamed kolot. These are the ones that a person has to hear. You understand? Very important to hear those. Because those are from the Torah. How is that from the Torah? So to, to make a rundown, the way it works is like this, right? That according to the Torah, we're obligated to hear nine voices from the shofar. Nine. Tesha kolot. Right? What does that mean? That you have to do three times something which is called teru'ah. Teru'ah three times. But teru'ah requires also before that, to Kiyah, and also afterwards. This is the rule. You have to have one against the other, right? Before, before the Teruah, you have to do Tekiah, a long one. Tekiah is a long one, right? One long one. Right, that's called Tekiah. Then we do Teruah in the middle, and then after also another Tekiah, right? It has to have two. One before and one after. Mm. This is the rule, right? So altogether, we have three voices over here. One Tekiah, one Teruah, and then Tekiah again. So we have to do that three times. According to the Torah, it has to be done three times. So altogether, three times three is nine. This is the obligation according to the Torah. Nine voices. Ah, so then why do we do 30? Well, we just said we have, according to the Torah, you really need nine. So then why do we do Shloshim Kolod, 30, 30 voices? So the answer is because there's a safek, right? They say the poskim, there's a doubt. What is the real Teruah? We're not really sure which, which one is the real one. What is Teruah? According to one opinion, Teruah is like this, right? Tu, tu, tu. It's called Shevarim. That's what we call that, right? Halakha. Shevarim. You know what Shevarim means in Hebrew? Broken. Like broken voices, you know? Tu, tu, tu. Why do we do this way? This is all like, it mimics, by the way, these, these shofarot that we do, these voices, it mimics the crying of a, of a woman when she's like bereaved of somebody, you know, some, at a funeral, or later, right? So the women, you know, when they cry at the funerals, there are several types of cry that they do. First, they do a long one, right? Like that long one, right? Then they do like like a middle size. That's the shvarim. It all mimics the cry, right? And then there is the short one, right? Like that, right? right. So the shofar mimics all these three types of crying that the women do. I have more shofar. You want to do that? That's okay. Next time. <laughs> Next time. Okay, so that's the idea, right? So all these three things mimics the crime. So what does that mean? We're not sure. Teru'ah. Which one is it? Is it shvarim? Tu, tu, tu. Or is it tu, 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 That's the second possibility. There's also a third possibility, which is both of them together. Right? Shvarim and teru'ah. Tu, 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 tu. Right? That, those two together are called teruah, according to the third opinion. So since we have three opinions on what is teruah, and since the shofar is from the, from the Torah, so therefore the rule is, right? What does that mean? When you have a doubt from the Torah, you have to cover all the possibilities. You have to be machmir. You have to be stringent. So therefore, this is the reason why we do all three possibilities. We cover all three possibilities. So the first possibility is what? That we cover, maybe teruah is 
Do 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 do. That's the the first one that we do. We do that three times. So that's already nine voices over there. The truth is, it's not. It's more than nine. You know why? Since the teruah, according to this opinion, is two voices together, shvarim and teruah together, as we just mentioned. So the truth is, over there comes out to be more than nine. Right? Comes out to be twelve. This is the idea, right? But don't they also, also in, I don't know, tradition, don't they also use that as, a, as an alarm, the shofar? Yeah, for war, right? That's something, yeah, that's, that's a different mitzvah. We don't have that today. Like, like when they were gathering. Uh, yeah, when they were, yeah, Moshe Rabbeinu, yes, yes, yes. Yes, they did, they Joshua, used that. Joshua. Today we don't have that, right? Moshe Rabbeinu, Yeshua, right? All these kinds of things. Today we don't have that, but this, right, we still have it until this day, right? Until, until this day. So the idea is like this, right? That a person has to know that the first nine, first, first 12 voices, are covering this possibility. Then we're covering, covering the second possibility, which is what? That maybe the real two was, do, do, do. So we do it this way three times, three times three. We do another nine, right? Altogether, now you have 21. Wailing, right? weeping, and whatever. Yeah, that, I like that. That's good, 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 good words. Wailing, weeping, right? All kinds of stuff like that. Yes, yes. So then we cover the third possibility that what? Maybe Tua is just two, 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 two. Maybe that's only that. So therefore, we have to do another nine to cover that possibility. So altogether, it's to cover all the possibilities. How many voices do we need? Altogether, we need 30, 30 voices. That's the idea, right? Mm-hmm. So according to the Torah, we have to do all 30 voices of these 30 voices. So a person has to make sure that he hears all those 30 voices. Why? Because if he didn't hear those 30 voices, he didn't fulfill his obligation. So what does that mean? Now he's left alone with the Satan, right, to accuse him about every sin that he did that year. Can you imagine? Who can stand like that, right? Who can stand with this kind of judgment? So therefore, right, in order to avert that, to, to avoid that, make sure you come to shul. You know, and you hear the shofar. Don't miss that, right? And gets rid of Satan. Don't now play hooky like that, that day, right? Go around doing something else. Smoking cigarettes, hanging around the park, playing backgammon, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know? Not Debbie, not Debbie, you know? All kinds of things like this. This is not the time for that now. A person has to come to shul. And he has to do the mitzvah, the mitzvah of shofar, which is considered to be the central theme of the... Uh, of the Rosh Hashanah, that's the idea. Well, if right? they don't let you in, you don't have seats. You can also hear from the outside, by the way. You know, no, from no, the hallway. Yeah, you can that's hear. Why, that's why I don't like the religion because they don't let you go pray when you want. Oh, you have to I go pay that. somebody. I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. It's it's quite it's quite it can be quite uh, frustrating this idea. Right. Yeah. But the truth is, you know, that it's definitely worthwhile to pay for that, right? To to have a seat for Rosh Hashanah. It's also a nice donation for the shul once in a while. You know, pay give a nice donation. So they can subsist all year, and right? it's the idea, right? So it's good. It covers all the bases, Baruch Hashem. Very good. Don't worry about that. Hashem will give it back to you. Whatever you spend on that, He gives it back, right? You know what the rule is, right? They say, regarding what you're asking, the rule is that whatever a person spends for his expenditures on Shabbat and Yom Tov, everything is reimbursed. So the Baruch gives you everything back. We know why? Because you did that for the mitzvah of Shabbat and Yom Tov. It also applies to, to Rosh Chodesh as well. A person makes expenditures expenditures to do Rosh Chodesh. What does that mean to make a seuda? To make a special meal for Rosh Chodesh? That also is reimbursed. So all these things that you spend for the holidays, everything is reimbursed. But once you're dead, you, you can't understand? spend your money. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, they'll get you. They'll get you. You know, they'll reimburse you. So, right, that's the reason why a person shouldn't be so careful, you know, worried about that. How much money am I spending for Rosh Hashanah? Spend it now, you know, be a little bit generous. And everything, everything will be okay, right? That's the idea. Don't, don't worry about that. So the point is, right, that a person who didn't hear these 30 voices, he has to hear it again somehow, right? What does that mean? He should go to a different shul, maybe, who's going to be doing it later a little bit, or they can come back for the, the one that they do before Mincha. Before Mincha, they do the blowing again in most shuls. Why? Because the women, you know, who are not able to hear it, they were not able to hear it uh, in the morning. Some of the women, because they're taking care of their children, they're doing all kinds of things, they're cooking, all kinds of things like this. So they, have to, they can come in here before Mincha, in the afternoon. So if a person missed it, right, you should come during the Mincha time. Why don't they do it outside? It doesn't make any difference. The outside makes a ruckus, you know, so people don't usually know it outside. Right? It's, it's, you know, it's uh, disturbing the peace, you know, as they say, right? So you don't want to, you know, outside is not really the, the, the best way to do it. It draws too much attention, you know, all kinds of anti-Semites come. You know, and they, 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 you, know, you, know, you don't want to have all these kinds of issues, right? Whatever. So that's why it's better to do it indoors, right? Whatever a person can do it indoors, more more discreet, more more proper. It's more proper to do it this way. There's no prohibition to do it outside as well, but uh, you know, eh, the person has to know, right? When did they blow? When did they blow the shofar? So all the all the services. As we said, right? That um, they do it right after the reading of the Torah. All right. Right so after read the read read the Torah, then that's when they do the shofar. That's, that's the idea, it, right? But at, that's at night. In the morning. 
Oh, in the morning. We don't do shofar at night. We don't do shofar at night. Only in the morning, right? So the idea is that a person should hear those 30 voices, make sure you hear. Because if you didn't hear, you didn't fulfill your obligation. And then you, know, you, have, you have to stand up against the judgment, right? Which is, can be something very, very harsh. Ah, but there's also other right, shofar that we do as well. What does that mean? That during the Musaf prayer, we also do another shofar. How many voices do we do all together in the shofar that day? Rosh Hashanah? We do 101 voices. Me'av Echad. Right? That's the idea. Because the rabbi said you should also do it in the Musaf prayer as well. But in the Musaf prayer, what they do is that they do three times during the silent one. They do another three times during the the out loud one, the, the Chazarat Hashats. So all together, right, if you add up all those, and also the one they do at the end, comes up to be 101. There's also another one they do. You know what they, which, which, which one it is? In the end, when we finish the Musaf and everything, towards the end, when we're about to say, right, Kaddish, uh, in the end, they also do another one, like a long one. Long one, right? That's also to confuse the Satan even more, right? To make him even, even more confused. That's the idea, right? So uh, this whole idea of, of doing the shofar is considered to be the central theme of the, of the Rosh Hashanah. So don't skip that, right? That's the idea. Make sure you hear the shofar. Because if not, you're going against the full force of the judgment, right? Who can do that? Who can, who can stand? Right? Such a thing like that. The question is like this, by the way. If a person missed the, the one that we said, right? The first one. The one which we say the same down. Can he, can he also fulfill his obligation by hearing the one in the Musaf? So the truth is, that regarding that, there's a machloket. There is a dispute if he can fulfill his obligation with the one in the Musaf. You know why? Because over there, we're doing it in a different order over there. Right? So there is, there is a dispute regarding that. So therefore, a person should not rely on that right? The best thing to do is to hear this, the one that we do sitting. To do your fulfill your obligation over there. If you weren't able to fulfill your obligation, so if you can, you know, hear the musaf, hear the musaf, or come back and hear before for, when they do the women's, when they do the women's, right? But the truth is that we have a rule in the Torah. What is what does the rule say? Mitzvah mitzvah grama nashim peturot. What does that mean? That all positive commandments, which are time bound, women are exempt. So what does that mean? The shofar is also like that. It's a positive mitzvah. What does that mean? It's something which we do actively. Active, it's an active mitzvah. Oh, it's also time bound. What does that mean? We only do it on Rosh Hashanah, once a year, right? That's the idea. So it's a time bound mitzvah. So the truth is that women are exempt from that. They're not really obligated according to the Torah to hear the shofar, the women, right? It's only the, it's only the men. Ah, so then why do we see them that they come they come in droves right into the shul? They come they they come uh, really a lot of people, a lot of women they come. What's the reason why? Because the custom is that they they try to come anyway, even though they're not obligated. But the custom is they try to come. What's the reason why? As we said, right, since it's considered to be such an important mitzvah, so therefore they also don't want to miss it. That's the idea, right? So they try to they try to show up, they try to come. That's the idea. So what does that mean? That a woman should try to come as a custom, but if she wasn't able to come, she doesn't really have a sin because, uh, right, as we said, uh, that um, uh, they're not really obligated, the women. Have a seat, please, relax. We're doing a lecture now. Yeah, please. Uh, so, um, as we said, right, that the women are, are not obligated, but very, very good for them to try to come. And also, as we said, right, that most shuls, most synagogues, if they don't do the morning one, and don't, they, the women don't hear in the morning, they do have also another one in the afternoon that they do, for the women, right, that's the idea. So if they didn't hear, but if you notice, right, the rabbi, when he comes to do the afternoon one, especially by us, you know, the Sfardim, right, Ashkenazim are a little bit different, I'll explain to you what the difference is. But the Sfardim, the rule is that when it's, when it's a time-bound mitzvah like this, that women are exempt, so we don't, they don't bless. What does that mean? They're not going to make this bracha, right? Lishma kol shofar. They're not going to make uh, this bracha, the women. Why is that? Because the bracha says, what does it say? It says, right? What does it mean, v'tzivanu? Commanded us. So how can a woman say that? Who commanded you? Right? Women, Hashem didn't command you to hear the shofar. So how can you say, v'tzivanu? Commanded us. Right? So according to Sephardi custom, according to the Rambam, Women are not going to bless for the shofar. So what does that mean? If the rabbi is blowing the shofar only for the women, the men already heard it, right? So in a case like that, what happens is that we don't bless for them. So we just start to, to blow right away. Do, 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 do. Right? No, no, no blessing. Why? Because the women don't, don't, need, don't need a blessing. But the truth is that the Ashkenazim are a little bit different in this. You know why? The Ashkenazim, they go according to Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbeinu Tam said, even the women should make a blessing for these mitzvot. What does that mean? Mitzvot say. Even though it's a tamba mitzvah and the women are exempt, it's true. 
But nevertheless, when we say the word Betzivanu, commanded us, says Rabbi Nuntan, it's talking about the whole nation as a whole. It's not talking about the women in, in particular. It's talking about the whole nation. He commanded the whole nation to do. So therefore, according to Rabbi Nuntan, you're allowed to say the bracha. Also for lulav, the same thing would apply to lulav as well, right? If a woman takes a lulav, doing the sukkot, by the Sephardic custom, she shouldn't make a blessing for that. Why is that? Because it's a time-bound mitzvah. Which is a positive mitzvah, time-bound. So according to the Sephardic custom, they don't make a bracha, they don't make a blessing for that, and they should be careful not to do that, by the way. But the Ashkenazim, they do. You know why? Because they're going to Rabbein Tam. Rabbein Tam says that even though it's a time-bound mitzvah and the women are exempt, nevertheless, when they say the word Betzivan, when we commanded us, we're talking about the nation as a whole. We're not talking about me particularly. This is the reason why Right, there's a difference between the Ashkenazim and Sephardim regarding this issue. But nevertheless, right, by us over here, we're not going to make the blessing for them. The Georgians, right, they do Sephardi. So they, they, don't, they, don't make a, they don't make a blessing for the women. The rabbi just comes and starts to blow. But there will be one exception for that. You know what it is? That he would have to make a bracha. You know what that is? If there was a man who didn't hear the shofar in the morning, right, he got up late, you know, and wandered around in the morning, right, paid hooky in the morning, right, it didn't come, didn't show up. So now what happens is, that he knows that there's also another blowing they're going to have them for the women. He's going to come and hear that one. You can do that, no problem, right? No, no problem, because you can hear it. But just one thing, right? If you come to hear the blowing for the women, you shouldn't be sitting with the women, you know? Don't sit, you're not going to sit with them, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Sit separately, you stand, you know, with, with, the, with the guy who's blowing in the, in the bima, you know, guess, you know? Over there you should stand. Don't, don't stand over there in a place where the women are sitting over there, you know? Mingle with them. As we said, right, when it comes to public events, the women, the women and women should be separate. In Jewish law, you know, that's the way it is. So here also, same thing, you know. Women are coming. Same thing as like, the women are coming to hear the Megillah. You know, there are some readings that are for women. So if you're coming to hear that Megillah and that reading, when it's for women, don't sit with the, with the women over there. Go stand with the, with them, the guys. You know what I mean? Be separate. That's the idea, right? That's the idea. Here also, same thing. But the point is like this, right? That if 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 one man even right didn't hear the shofar in the morning, and he comes to hear the shofar during during the one that during the, during the afternoon one for the women, so, so then the Tokea should make a bracha. Why? Because there's a man over here. He needs a bracha. Right? So in a case like that, if there's even one man who needs to hear the shofar, you should make a blessing for him. What does that mean? He's going to say, make two blessings, right? Baruch atah Hashem, lishma kol shofar, and then shechian also. That's the way it should be, right? So a person has to know, right? According to the situation, there's different rules that apply. This is, this is the, the main idea, but a person has to make sure, right? Either way, whatever it is, uzar mazrat, you know? Whatever it is, a person should make sure that he hears the shofar. If you didn't hear the shofar in Rosh Hashanah, especially as we said, right, the one that's with who's sitting, which is the most important ones, if you didn't, then you didn't fulfill your obligation. There's, there's a, also a rule about that, right? They say, let's say, to, to, to bear out the point, right, like let's say Musaf, right, of Rosh Hashanah, it's considered to be the most important prayer that we say on Rosh Hashanah, the Musaf. It's a long one, you know? We do the special, special blessings over there, shofarot, right, uh, zichonot, all kinds of things. Okay, it's considered very important. But nevertheless, they say, right, if you can go a person has a choice to go to two places. One place, they know how to do shofar over there, but they don't, they don't know how to do musaf. Right? There's another place, they know how to do musaf, but they don't know how to do shofar. So which place should you go to? You should go to the place where you know how to do shofar. Why is that? Because the shofar is from the Torah. The musaf is not from the Torah. The musaf is from the rabbis, it's from the rabbis. You know what I mean? So a person has to, has to always uh, favor the issue of, of the shofar uh, right, uh, in, a, in opposition to all the other mitzvot of Rosh Hashanah. So, also, there's another thing I want to bear out, right? A person should try to hear the shofar from a person who's trained, you know, to, to, know, to blow the shofar properly. Because if a person doesn't know the halachot of shofar, it may very well be that he's not blowing properly the shofar. You're not going to fulfill the obligation. Right? Number one, first of all, what the, what the rabbi should do, you know, when they, before they blow the shofar, before they start, he should remind the community, make an announcement, right? Now we're doing the mitzvah of shofar, Right, which is a mitzvah from the Torah, positive mitzvah from the Torah. So, in order to fulfill your obligation, he has to, the rabbi should tell them, you have to have in mind to fulfill your obligation from the one who's blowing the shofar, the tokia, and he also has to have you in mind, the person who's blowing. Right, so the community has to have him in mind to be to be fulfill his obligation from from him, and he also has to have them in mind as well. If they don't have this right uh, dual dual right uh, c- concentration over here, right, this kavana over here. They don't fulfill their obligation. So, the person who, you know, who blows the shofar, you should remind the community that have that in mind that you're fulfilling your obligation with my blowing to do the mitzvah of shofar. 
You know why? Because we have a rule. Mitzvot tzrichot kavana. What does that mean? Every mitzvah needs kavana. You need to have intention to fulfill a mitzvah. If you do a mitzvah without intention, what does that mean? Just like haphazard. You know, just like, you know, for fun, you know? Mitasek. So just, you know, it happened to be that I did some coincidence. You don't fulfill your obligation like that for mitzvot. You have to have intention to do a mitzvah. What does that mean? You have to be thinking, you know? I'm doing now this mitzvah. I'm thinking now, I'm doing now this mitzvah. If he doesn't have that in mind, he doesn't fulfill his obligation. The person needs intention. So, this here also, the, the, the rabbi should remind everybody, have in mind that we're doing now the mitzvah. This is the idea, right? Also, another very important thing is that there are some people who like to, unfortunately, you know, which is a mistake, they like to, when they're blowing the shofar, they pick up some kind of a, you know pamphlet, you know, start to do all kinds of confessions over there, vidu, you know, hatati, aviti, pashati. The truth is, right, that the, the poskim say that this is very wrong to do that. When they're blowing the shofar, don't not start saying all kinds of confessions and all kinds of things like this. Just be quiet and listen. You know, you have to, you have to listen to the shofar. If you start now talking confessions and all kinds of things, you may miss parts of the shofar. You know, so it's considered to be like a problem. You know that you're doing that. So a person should avoid that at all costs. Don't start talking all kinds of things in, in the middle of the shofar. When he finishes, he can do whatever you want. After, after, afterwards, once he's done. But in the middle of the shofar, now you're doing vidu, you, know, you know, you may not be able to hear properly. A person can't concentrate on two things at the same time, you know? Like they used to do, you know, the president. You remember the president? He couldn't walk and chew gum together? Remember that guy? Who was that? Right? Ford, Ford. Ah, remember Ford? Ford. Ford, right? He couldn't walk and chew gum, right? So the same thing over here. You're trying to walk and chew gum together. You know what I mean? Say vidui and also to hear the shofar. How are you going to concentrate on both of them? You know I mean? people, yeah, some people do that. Yeah, some people say, say all kinds of things over there. So the truth is, right, the poskim warned not to do that. Not a good idea, too. Very, very bad. You know, very bad idea. Now you're doing that. So what does that mean? If you want to have some intention of doing tshuva, just have it in your mind, you know, to think about it, but don't say nothing. You can think about tshuva. You can think, I'm going to do tshuva. You know, I'll be a good boy. You know, I won't do it anymore. I promise, you know. All kinds of things, right? But don't start opening your mouth and talking. You know, this is not time for that. Shofar, you have to be silent during, during the shofar, right? Some people start to cry. It's okay, okay. If he comes to cry a little bit, no problem. Even though Rosh Hashanah, really, you're not supposed to cry. It's Yom Tov. You know? But they say that if a person came to cry because, you know, he got emotional about Teshuvah, about regretting his sins, it's okay, you know? No, no, no problem with that. He got emotional, you know? A little bit, you know? Got, uh, a little bit, uh. The truth is, it's Yom Tov. So Yom Tov, you're not supposed to cry, but if a person got into it a little bit and he's got emotional, you have no problem with that. So if, even if he cries, okay, we have no problem. but listen to the shofar. It's not the time to be talking right now. That's the idea, right? Also, another thing is that once the rabbi makes the brachot for the shofar, a person is not allowed to talk about other things at, at that time. Until he finishes the whole prayers. Why is that? Because there's going to be more shofar during the musaf. And after the musaf also, there's going to be more shofar. So if a person now gets distracted and starts talking about other things, that bracha that he made, the blessing that he made for the shofar, is like being nullified like that. So therefore, a person right, has to make sure he doesn't say anything, doesn't talk. About, he can talk about the prayers, he can talk about the shofar, things which are relevant, pertinent to the mitzvot that he's doing now. He can talk about that. When it comes to talking about other things, mundane issues, mundane matters, not the time for that now. First, finish all the prayers, finish all the shofar, then you can talk later on, right? You can come out and schmooze with your friends and outside, no problem, right? But uh, everything has its proper time, everything has its as a proper proper place, right? That's the idea. So a person has to be very careful, right? We're going this this mitzvah. So as we said, right, that the shofar is the number one issue on Rosh Hashanah. But a person also should be careful regarding all the mitzvot. Come to the shul, right? Do the prayers properly. Make sure you have a good machzor. If a person doesn't have a machzor, he doesn't have a sitter to pray from Rosh Hashanah, how is he going to pray properly like that, you know? I have to borrow somebody's, you know. Oh yeah, can you lend me, you know? And like in between, you know, matchoe, you know. Uh, this is not, uh, yeah, you're right. The truth is, you know, the shul has, but sometimes they're 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 finished, you know. They they everybody takes. There's not enough left. Always there's a shortage of of, of machzorin, you know. So if you rely on the shul, you may get an unpleasant surprise, right? Then there'll be nothing there for you, you know. People come, they take. Yeah, okay, bring your own, you know. Have your own. Because you also have things to do at home as well. To, all kinds of prayers. Say the Kiddush of Rosh Hashanah. All kinds of things. So how are you going to say the Kiddush? How are you going to do the prayers at home? If you don't have a Machzor for Rosh Hashanah, you have to have a Machzor. You know, make sure you have one. And if you don't speak Hebrew, try to get also one with translation as well. You know, so this way you understand at least, at least a little bit what you're saying. Mm-hmm. You know, otherwise it shouldn't be just like, just, you know, some kind of a, 
you know, bird, birdie, birdie chirps, you know, chirps of a birdie, you know, chirp, 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 chirp. you don't even know what you're talking about. So what kind of prayer is that, right? The person has to make sure, the prayer is said. How many se'udot do we have to do on Hashanah? How many meals do we have to have? Since it's Yom Tov, we have to have two meals on Hashanah, right? Not like Shabbat. Shabbat, we need three, right? Shalosh se'udot, on Shabbat we do three, but on Yom Tov, which is Rosh Hashanah, which is Yom Tov, we need two meals. What does that mean? One at night and one in the morning, right? That's the idea. So a person has to be make sure that he does a se'udot. The se'udot are also very, very important, right? That's the idea. There are all kinds of customs, by the way. We talk, really talked about the simanim, right? We're going to the simanim in our last lecture, uh, the, on Tuesday. We talked about the simanim, what, what the person has to eat on Rosh Hashanah. We talked about that. Look in, on YouTube uh, or Facebook, you'll see the lecture over there towards the end about what, how we have to do with simanim. But regarding, also regarding a person, there are all kinds of customs, by the way, in Rosh Hashanah, especially with the Ashkenazim, that what? That they eat only sweet stuff on Rosh Hashanah, right? There's nothing sour. Nothing spicy, nothing sour, right? Nothing bitter. A lot of Ashkenazim, they do like that. What's the reason why? There should be a sweet year. It, could be, it should be a siman tov, you know, a good omen for the whole year. Just like we had Rosh Hashanah, it's all sweet. So the whole year should be sweet like that. That's the idea, you know? Honey. But the truth is, to be honest with you, if a, if a person likes to have some, also some sour stuff and bitter, you know, you, know, you can't eat without that, let's say, right? For him, it's not a meal, unless he has some pickles, you know, some olives, you know, some hummus, you know. Hummus is also a little bit bitter. It has vinegar in there, you know. Things like this, right? Uh, all kinds of things. If a person can't live without that, that's his diet. You know, we're not, he's not obligated to have only thing, everything sweet. He can also have some things like that, no problem. There's no prohibition to eat things which are a little bit sour or something like that. It's just that some people have a custom like that, you know, the, that everything is sweet on Rosh Hashanah. That's fine, you know, if you want to do it this way, that's good. If that's your custom, you want to do it that way, and you can, your stomach can tolerate it, right? Some people can't tolerate everything, everything, everything sweet. They need a little bit that contrast, you know? A little bit, little bit this, a little bit that, right? Otherwise, you can't digest your food. We don't have anything sour. They say, right, the sour makes you, helps you digest. The vinegar, right, helps you digest the food. Acid. Yeah, exactly, the acid, right? That's the idea. So a person, some people need that. They can't go without that. So if, if a person needs to have some sour stuff, that's, he enjoys that, there's no prohibition to have uh, things like this. You know? uh, that, that's what makes you happy. Be happy, you know. That's the, there's also all kinds of customs. Some people, right, they're brought down in the, in the, in the poskim. Some people don't eat grapes on Rosh Hashanah. Especially black, black grapes, right? They don't eat? They're black grapes, yeah. Because this all has a connotation of din, judgment, you know, these kinds of... Also, they don't eat nuts, right? It goes in, like hazelnuts. Nuts, yes. Right? Yeah. All kinds of things like this. I, I know the Georgians also have the yes, custom yes, customs like this. Know. Yeah, they don't, they don't eat, right? The truth is, there's no prohibition regarding these things, right? If a person wants to eat them, I can't tell you it's asur, it's pro prohibited. There's no prohibition. <laughs> it's just that you know, some people have a custom like that. They don't eat these things because they have all kinds of connotations of judgment, these foods. You know, the name of the food has connotation of judgment. Then he never said, it's, uh, don't need the negoshi, and he never said uh, in the Torah. It says, it, it says in the poskim, brought down, but it's a minhag. You know, it's, it's not obligation. <laughs> Some people have a minhag like that. You know, so that it's not, that it doesn't really obligate you so much. So if a person wants to eat these things, there's no prohibition, according to, according to halakha. You know, but uh, if you want to, if you're, if you're concerned about these things and it bothers you, whatever, you think that's going to cause you judgment, whatever, so don't eat these things. There are also some people don't eat fish on Rosh Hashanah also. There are some, some customs like this as well, right? But the truth is, in, in as far as... Fish, fish heads we eat. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about the simanim, yeah. yeah. It's true, but there are some people don't eat fish on, on Rosh Hashanah. Mm. All kinds of customs like this. Every person does according to his custom, but the truth is that all these things are not obligations. A person wants to have fish on Shabbat, he wants to have nuts, he wants to have grapes. He's allowed to eat these things. There's no, there's no, there's no prohibition. But, uh, you know, if that's his custom, he wants to keep that custom like that, whatever, he's concerned about it, you know, so the, all the power to you, you know, I have nothing against that, right? No, no, no issue with that. But, uh, you know, there's the, a, a person has definitely what to, you know, if he wants to eat a regular meal, like he eats on Shabbat, with, with sour, you know, and it's, you know, sweet, sour, a little bit, a little bit bitter, a little bit that, a little bit hot stuff, you want to say, no, no, there's no prohibition of regarding that. But the truth is that there is a custom by many, many, many Jews that they eat sweet on Rosh Hashanah, especially, you know? It should be, it should be a sweet year. Mm -hmm. So even, even the dishes that they make, right, like the chicken and the, and the, and the meat, everything they make sweet. Simis. Right, some honey in there, <coughs> some sugar in there, you know, stuff like this. And you know how it is, right? I don't have to tell you. you know, you've, been, you've been to the families. You know what I'm talking about, right? That's the idea. So that's good, you know, not, that's, that's very, very praiseworthy. It's a nice thing to do. Not obligation, as we said, but definitely very, very praiseworthy. Also, the Gemara says another thing, right? That a person should try to eat. What kind of meat should he eat on Rosh Hashanah? Meat, when it comes to meat, right? Basar. Brisket. 
So, ah, good, good one. I like that. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Make, bring me, bring us some. Bring us yeah. some. <laughs> you have nobody to cook anymore. <laughs> Can't be hungry now. <laughs> nobody to cook me hungry. Okay. So seriously, right? What what kind of so says the says the says the Gemara? A person should eat fat meat on on Rosh Hashanah, right? Yeah. Not lean stuff, right? Yeah. Save the lean stuff for for for, for weekdays. Yeah. What's the reason why? Because the fat meat has a connotation also of like you know having a good life, you know, mm. being yeah. wealthy, yeah. rich, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. you know? Yeah. right, right. Kind of, you know, yeah. nice, good, luxurious, good life. You I'm know? a fat bitch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So that's the idea. So there's also an issue like that, right? To have all kinds of foods which connote good living. You know, good, should be a good sign for the whole year. So they say, bring nice fatty meat. You know, some, you know, some good stuff. You know, with some fat over there. That's the idea, right? Enjoy it good. If you like that stuff, you know, person. Some people don't like that. So, you know, today, when they see, there are, there are people today who see some fat, you know, they'll cut it off out of the meat. They won't eat that stuff. They'll say, it's not healthy for you, you know? Whale. Well, you know how it is, right, today. People are very particular about all, all kinds of things like this. So, and also, another thing, right, which we learn in the halakha, the, the sages warn us, that even though Rosh Hashanah, a person is supposed to have two meals, and it's Yom Tov, so there should be festive meals, as we said, right? But nevertheless, they say, don't go too far, you know, don't eat too much on Rosh Hashanah. Don't make it like a, a, a party, you know, uh, a little bit too too much. Why is that? Because you know, after all, bottom line, it's a day of judgment. You know what I mean? So you don't want to get too silly on Russia. Yeah. 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 Lose lose control and start getting silly, having a little bit too much snaps. You know, a little bit too much too much too many shots. It's you know, too one, two, three, four, five. Boom, you know, starts to act silly and ridiculous. You don't want to act silly on Russia. You know, it's not a time for being silly. So I'm not telling you you can't drink at all. By the way, you can have one or two. You know. But having three, four, five drinks, it's going to make you silly a little bit, right? Drive home. That's not, the, that's, that's not really the spirit of Rosh Hashanah, you know? So a person has to know, right, Rosh Hashanah is not a time for eating too much and drinking too much. It's a time for, you have to be a little bit, right, somber, you know, a little bit uh, reserved. Leave a little bit room for, you know, don't go too far. Don't go 100%. It's not a party, Rosh Hashanah, right? It's a, it's a day of judgment. Right? A person has to remember. Even though, by the way, the halacha says that we shouldn't go into Rosh Hashanah worried, you know, like with a worried heart. Like, you know, dark devil, you know, bokeh you know. Oh, you know, what's going to be with me? Oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Oh, you know. Kankar, you know, shaking, his, he's shivering in his pants, you know. Like, yeah. it shouldn't be like that. Okay. You shouldn't go into Rosh Hashanah like that. What does that mean? We should go into Rosh Hashanah with confidence. Don't be, like, scared, you know. Don't be, don't. Because they say, by the way, that when a person gets scared, it damages his mazal. Wow. You know? That's so, every, you, know, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? So, uh, don't, also, also when a person has a, has a battle with something, right? He has to fight some, you know, fight somebody. The worst thing is to get scared. Once you get scared, you lose. You lost the battle. Yeah. You know what I mean, the only way to fight, the only way to, to be strong, the only way is not to get not to get scared. Yeah. You know what I mean? So here also we're having a battle against the Yetzirah, against the judgment. You know, so don't go in, you know, like shivering, you know, in your pants. You know, it shouldn't be like that. Be confident, you know. But don't don't be overly overly cocky. And that's the idea, right? By eating too much and drinking too much, you get cocky. You know, a little bit silly. There's not time for silliness, you know what I mean? So you got to find that middle ground. On the one hand, be, be happy, be confident, you know, smile on your face, nice, happy, simcha, but don't get silly, you know, Rosh Hashanah. Well, there's not a time for silliness, you know. It's a serious time. I want to mention also one more thing, right? We'll, we'll, stop, we'll stop here. Right? Uh, regarding sleeping on Rosh Hashanah, right? It says in the Gemara Yerushalmi, call the damich berosh Hashanah, damich mazale. What does that mean? Whoever sleeps on Rosh Hashanah, his mazal also sleeps, right? That's what it says, right? This, this halakha. So what does that mean? It means to say that a person should try to avoid sleeping on Rosh Hashanah. What is it? I sleep for 40, 48 hours not sleep? We're talking about sleeping in the daytime. That's the idea, right? At night you can sleep. No problem, right? Sleep as much as you need, right? Six hours, eight, seven hours, eight hours, whatever you usually do. Whatever, as much as you need. Not too much also, right? Not, don't, don't exaggerate. But uh, nevertheless, right, they say in the daytime, a person should try to avoid sleeping on Rosh Hashanah. So, if he does, his mazal will also be sleeping. Mm-hmm. What's the reason why? Because on Rosh Hashanah, in the daytime, they're judging him. The judgment doesn't happen at night. You know why there's a rule in Halakha? The bed din. That's it, that's the idea, right? That's the idea. So they, they say, the rule is like this, right? And uh, the Halakha says that a person is not allowed to do din, judgment at night. Also here, when you have a bed din, right? Mm-hmm. Bed din cannot be done at night. No? You know, this is the same thing, same thing idea, same idea. So also the Beddin Lamala, the upper the upper Beddin also, uh-huh. does not work at night. It's closed. 
Uh, you know? Daytime. The recess, you know, recess time, right? So therefore, the judgment really occurs when? In the daytime. That's the idea, right? So in, in the daytime of Rosh Hashanah, a person is being judged, right? So the time that you're being judged, you don't want to be sleeping, right? You know, that's not the time to be sleeping. Because you have to be alert. What does that mean? That a person, when he sleeps, his mazal also sleeps. You know, he's, 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 not, he's not alert. His neshama is not, is not functioning 100%. Mm. You know what happens, right? When a person goes to sleep, he loses a part of his neshama. He goes up to shemaim. Mm. You know what I mean? So you don't want to be in a state like that when you're, when you're being judged. You want to have that full force. You want to be awake. You want to be, right? That's, that's the idea. This is the reason why a person shouldn't sleep on Rosh But nevertheless, right? So what's, the, what's really the halakha? Is there really a prohibition to sleep on Rosh Hashanah? It's not a prohibition. It's just a good advice. You know what I'm telling you, right? If you want to have a good mazal, you don't, you want, you don't mazal, so try to stay up on Rosh Hashanah. Right? If you can't, let's say, there are some people who can't, by the way. You know, they can't go without a nap. Say it again, Yom Kippur? <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, what do you mean? <laughs> Same thing on Yom Kippur. No, Yom Kippur we don't find that, because Yom Kippur is not a day of judgment. Oh. You know, it's not a day of judgment, it's a day of atonement. That's a little bit different, right? The day of atonement, right? Kapara. You know, Slicha, Kapara. You know, this is the idea. The day of judgment is Rosh Hashanah. So, what Rosh that means Rosh is like this. And Yom, Yom Kippur, Yom Yom Kippur you're, you're allowed to sleep. It's not a judgment day? It's a day of atonement. Forgiveness, you know? Forgiveness? This is the idea, right? I'm sorry, what are you saying? You're allowed to Yes, you're allowed to sleep on Yom Kippur. What does that mean? When you finish, let's say, Shachrit, I mean, Musaf, right? Let's say you're a little bit tired. Yeah. You're allowed to, before Mincha, one hour, let's say you want to sleep. You can sleep one hour, two hours. If you have time to sleep, no problem. There's no prohibition to sleep on Yom Kippur. Right? But on Rosh Hashanah, right, they say, don't try, don't do that. But the question is, what, what, what are we talking about, right? So the truth is, first of all, says the Ariz Shalom, one of the great Mekubalim, as we as you know, he says that after Chatzot Yom, you're allowed to sleep. What does that mean? After midday, which is now about quarter to one in our time, right, in our area, about quarter to one, once that time comes, you're allowed to sleep, he says. He himself also slept, the Arizal, it says, right? After, after Chatzot, after, after midday. Mm-hmm. What's the reason why? So he said the Arizal, that after midday, they don't have a Beddin over there. They close it, right? Uh-huh. Meaning what? The Beddin is only working, right, the Beddin <laughs> is only, only working in the morning. They do a morning shift only, Mm-hmm. Once the once the mid midday comes, ayom, which is about quarter to one, as we said, mm-hmm. that thing is closed, adjourned, right? That's the idea. Mm-hmm. They take a recess. So therefore, there's no judgment. So the Arizal tells us that what? That a person is allowed to sleep after midday. That's the idea. So if a person wants to take an afternoon nap in Roshana, according to this, he's allowed to take an afternoon nap. Right? First have your meal, eat your eat your food, go home, right? Have a little meal, whatever, and then if you have time to sleep, right, uh, to go to sleep. That's the idea. Right? Right, exactly. So uh, also Rosh Hashanah. So we're talking about Yom Rosh Hashanah. Sure. Yeah, Rosh Hashanah, yeah. But, That's the idea. Sleep, right? but after, after Chatzot, you're allowed to sleep, right? After, after midday. Ah, after That's midday, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Even Rosh Hashanah, yes. yes. Even Rosh Hashanah. That's the idea, right? So the well, question is about what about in the morning, right? So that's the hardest part. The hardest part of this, of this is in the morning. What does that mean? In the morning, people are usually not waking up on time. Because the morning really comes when? About 5.30, it's already morning. You know, 5.40, 5.30, 5.40, whatever. So because it's already dawn, you know? So a person should try to get up before that. If he really wants to do this halakha properly, the best thing to do is get up like 5.30 in the morning in Rosh Hashanah. Let's say he can't do that, right? So not everybody is able to do that. That's the thing, right? So at least try to get up before quarter to seven. You know, like 10 to seven. You know why? Because that's Netzach That's a sunrise. Sunrise in this time of year is not about 10 to seven. So if you can get up 10 to seven, that's also good because that's also considered to be like still not full morning until the sun comes up. So a person should try to get up. At least if he can't get up five thirty, at least quarter to seven. Try to get up. You know, if you, if, uh, right? if if you can do that. What about if he wasn't able to do that either, right? So the truth is that there is one opinion. Rosh Hashanah Zaman Arbach. He says Rosh Shalom. He was a rabbi from my generation, one big rabbi. He says that it's okay. You know why? Because since you were sleeping at night, and you went in the into the day, and you weren't able to wake up, so that's not. He's, that is, he, does, he says that that's not considered to be sleeping. He said consider, sleeping is when you actively go to sleep when you already were up. You know, in the daytime, and you went to sleep. That's when it's considered. So, according to this opinion, that's also okay. You know, so there is what to rely on. Also, you know that a person can sleep a little bit in the morning. What does that mean? He didn't wake up exactly on time. A person the Chachila shouldn't rely on this opinion. But if he wasn't able to get up, so he has that also. Right, what to rely on, as we said. So the point is, Rabbi that a person should try to fulfill all these things, uh, and Kadosh Baruch Hu should give you a good, blessed New Year. You too. Shana Tova Tuka. Thank you. And should have good blessings and abundance, spiritual and physical, with Hashem. Only sweet and good things, good tidings and smachot. Exactly. Amen, amen. Chazak Baruch, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Shana Tova.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.